Hi, this is Pastor Jeff from Community Covenant Church. I'm glad you're able to join me for this week's message here as we continue in our Lenten sermon series. This image of three crosses on a hill is uh, pretty well-known, very familiar to most of us. Those three crosses were represented of Jesus' death sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus was crucified between two other criminals. We don't have any information about those criminals. We don't know what their names were. Um, we have no idea what their crimes were. They were obviously serious enough to be condemned to death. But we do know that they did have an interaction with Jesus during the crucifixion. And we have some of Jesus' last words recorded as conversation back and forth, a little bit of conversation between these criminals who were crucified with him. We're in this Lenten series that we're calling Famous Last Words, and we're talking about the final words that were recorded of Jesus from the cross. The gospel writers have recorded seven different times when Jesus spoke from the cross. And so we're taking each of those and looking at them and figuring out what is it that Jesus was communicating? What is the reason why the gospel writers recorded these? And how do these words speak to us and our situation today, thousands of years after Jesus' death on the cross? Well, this is right now going to be an interactive portion of the message. So I don't know if you're watching this by yourself. Um, if you're with somebody else, then I encourage you to use this time to have a little conversation. The first thing I want you to do is to consider if you, for you, if you're going to give yourself a score between 1 and 100 of how good a person that you are. So the scale is, you know, one would be the absolute worst person and 100 would be perfect. Jesus scale, no sin, you are perfect. You are exactly like Jesus. So here's a hint, you are not exactly like Jesus. So the 100 is not an option. Um, you may think you're there, but you're wrong. <laughs> that right there tells you. Um, and for some perspective, okay, the low end of the scale would be the really bad people, the murderers, the Hitlers, the 49er fans. Oh, that's my little joke there. Um, people who are really evil and, uh, you know, think about uh, Vladimir Putin and his, some of his actions nowadays. Um, on the other end, the high end of the scale, the high numbers would be people like Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, the, the people who are extra good and extra um, close to God and doing the right thing. Okay, so think, have you got, do you have your number? Okay, so if you're with somebody else, turn to them and share your number. Take a moment and uh, ask them their number. How good a person are you based on this kind of scale? So take a moment here. Maybe you want to pause the video or take a second just to share what number you came up with for yourself and what this other person did too. Now you probably, I'm not, I didn't give you time to really talk about it. You can pause the video if you want to talk about this. So, defending yourself. Why did you say that number? Why should your number be different or the other person's number be different? So, but let me just consider this. Um, identify, were you in this 1 to 30 range? Um, that's kind of sad if you feel that way. And um, maybe you graded yourself in this 30 up to 50. You're not super bad, but you know, actually the people who are in that 30 to 50 range make the the higher numbers possible, I guess, you know, if you just get in comparison. How about if you're in the 50 to 80 score? So you're like, okay, I'm, I'm not failing completely, but I'm not an A. I'm up there, you know, in the C range, maybe up to a low B. 
well, congratulations if you uh, got that far. Now, how about those of you, did you any of you scale your, grade yourself on an 80 to 100 range? Well, you know, perfect people like you kind of annoy me. <laughs> um, here's the, the reality is that ranking ourselves on this kind of thing about how good a person we are uh, may be kind of fun. And um, what really happens when we do that is two things. Um, it makes us feel better about ourselves, perhaps, if we consider ourselves our number um, and we're thinking in comparison to other people, or it makes us feel worse about ourselves because we're, you know, we don't feel good enough. And then we're constantly searching about other people and how are you? Am I better than that person? Well, at least I'm higher than that person. The problem is that um, we get in this wrong way of approaching it. Here were these two criminals who were being crucified um, on either side of Jesus. And in Luke 23, we have this encounter here. It says, Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. These guys were not good people. If they were on that scale, they would definitely be way down on the low numbers. Crucifixion tells us that they were evil people because crucifixion was one of the ways that they would execute criminals, but it was the most horrific, painful possible ways. People died on a cross, not from what we maybe in a first impression might think of like, well, blood loss. No, that's really not the thing. They were taking days. And actually the way that people died from crucifixion was suffocation. They, as they're hanging from the spikes through their wrist is then they, they can't, it contracts their lungs. And so they have to kind of pull up to be able to take a breath. So imagine the excruciating pain of that. And they were, um, is oftentimes days before they died. That's why a lot of times there were cases where, and then the Gospels, it talks about how the Roman soldiers went to break the legs of the prisoners, these other criminals, so that it would hasten their death. Jesus didn't have to have that happen because he was already dead. This was a horrible, humiliating way to die. In fact, the, the word excruciating when we think about pain, excruciating comes from that word crucifix, um, meaning out of the cross is excruci excruciating. So this was horrible. It was also a really expensive thing for Romans to crucify somebody because they, like I said, it took days oftentimes for people to die and they required four or more soldiers to be process of the crucifixion and all that kind of stuff. And so this was an expensive proposition. They needed to really want this person to experience the worst death possible. It was done to make a statement to the public where the Romans are saying, this person is especially bad and we want you to realize what happens if you are in his category. So picking up verse 39 in Luke 23, it says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So, you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Here is this, you know, guy. He is dying, but he's doesn't have, he still has time to ridicule Jesus. But then it says, but the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, this is Luke's account. In Matthew's account of, of the crucifixion in Matthew 27, he actually records that both of these criminals, at least at the beginning, were both mocking and insulting Jesus initially. But apparently one of them changed his attitude, changed his mind in his relationship to Jesus. This encounter um, and the words that are recorded contain one of the most important truths in life. 
and they also correct one of the biggest misunderstandings in the world. And that is this misunderstanding that good people go to heaven because good people don't go to heaven. I hear some of you saying, what are you talking about? What do you mean good people don't go to heaven? Well, who gets to go to heaven then? Well, the reality is good people don't go to heaven. The ones who go to heaven are the forgiven people. Here's the thing. You don't, you know, if you're going to say good people go to heaven, it's like, like how good? 50 plus on our scale? A 75 plus? 80 plus? 90 plus? 99.9? I mean, where is the scale if it's about goodness? Instead, there's a huge difference because none of us are really good. If we look for good people, none of us are really good when we talk about that. You know, one of these criminals was forgiven. Let's consider why he was forgiven. Well, first the most obvious one is that he admitted his wrong. He admitted his need. In uh, in verse forty one, he turned to he talked to the other criminal and he said, "We deserve what we are getting here." But Jesus didn't deserve anything. He didn't do anything wrong. But we are guilty. We did wrong. And here, this this man admitted his wrong. Most of us don't want to admit our wrong. That's why we are always working on comparing ourselves to other people. What's your score? Well, my number is higher than your number. Um, or we look for loopholes of why we're not really guilty. Or we spin things around. Or maybe we redefine words so that it doesn't seem that we're actually so bad. Because, well, it depends on what is, is. You know, things like that. But here's the truth. We're all guilty. We're all guilty of doing wrong. We're all guilty of lying, whether it's an outright obvious lie or it's just half truths, or maybe it's lying by omitting the truth completely and we're kind of shading things, making it look better. We're guilty of stealing big or little and cutting corners. And, you know, now we're in the tax season. How many people are guilty of kind of stealing by playing the games and twisting things around and making it seem like you don't owe as much as you do. How about idolatry? Putting other people or things or pursuits in front of God, whether it's our job, whether it's our things we do for fun and pleasure, whether it's another person, more important than our relationship with God. Guess what? Those three Idolatry, stealing, lying, those are three of the Ten Commandments, and I could probably go through all the rest of the Ten Commandments, let alone all the rest of the things that are, am I honoring God or am I not honoring God? You know, sin is anything we say or think or do that is not in line with God's will. That covers a whole lot. Even the things you think, those are sins just as well, as much. Even if you you grade yourself on a really high number uh, and you're only a tiny bit bad, you only do a few little minor things that aren't right, you only sin this much, it doesn't matter. It means you're still guilty. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all all of God's laws. So it doesn't matter if your score is a 12 or a 48 or a 72 or a 99.999. According to God's perspective, you are just as guilty as anybody else. Every person sins. Every person falls short of God's glory. Now, why are we talking about this? Because the common misperception is that God has this big scale and he loads up the good side of what we do in our life and versus the bad side. And we and then he gets to this ending thing where he goes, okay, which one outweighs the other? That's how we think about God's justice, how we think about God's judging of us of whether we 
deserve salvation or not to go to heaven. But the reality is exactly what James is saying here. If you are not perfect, you don't get in. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't even grade on a scale of, okay, well, you, you did an A worth and you get in. God's standard is perfection. And if you aren't perfect, you're out of luck, buddy. That's impossible. Then how could anybody get in? Well, that's why we need a savior. Because in our own effort, we'll never be good enough. We need a savior. And that is the other reason why, the second part of why the forgiven guy, criminal, was forgiven. Not only did he admit his wrong, that he was not perfect, and there was no way he could have been perfect, and he was far from perfect in his own admission, but he admitted he was wrong, and then second of all, he asks for eternal help. You know, both of these criminals asked for help. I mean, the uh, the one guy was kind of like making fun of Jesus and goes, hey, you know, get us down, you get down too if you're the Messiah, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't really doing that. And you know what? People who aren't even sure that God exists will often ask for help. They get in a bind and they go, God, help me. You know, if you're really there, give me give me some help. Help me out in my circumstances. A lot of people have that same attitude as the other criminal who said, hey, if you're really the Christ, if you're really the Messiah, then save me to save yourself. If you're really there, God, make my life better help heal my grandma, help me get a date, uh, help me to get the money I need to pay this debt, whatever it is. We play those kind of games. But here's the thing. Instead of just asking for the stuff, help me in this circumstance, help fix this problem, this guy asked for eternal help. He asked for help that is lasting and really matters. The biggest need that all of us have. And right there in in verse 42, he says, he said, said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Both of these guys on either side of Jesus were guilty. They were both suffering severely. They both needed a savior. They both heard and witnessed the very same things, but one of them was forgiven and the other one wasn't. Every single one of us is one or the other of those two. You listening to me right now, you are either in that forgiven side or in the unforgiven side. It's amazing how you may be able to you know, to sit next to somebody um, and uh, one person will respond to God's offer of forgiveness and the other one won't. It's all a matter of what do we do with what we've been presented. Each of us have the same need for forgiveness. Each of us have the same opportunity. It doesn't matter what number you are. If you're an 82, Jesus becomes meeting you in that 82 and providing the next 12 to get you to 100. If you're a 12, then Jesus comes in and becomes the 82 to get you to 100. It was through a Savior who makes up the difference, who makes it possible for you to be forgiven and experience that eternal blessing. Because, you know, technically according to that verse in James, we're all zeros compared to Jesus being a 100. None of us are able to do that. The scale is kind of a joke. I mean, why are we even talking about a scale? Because a scale means zero in terms of eternity, in terms of salvation. It's not about our efforts. It's about Jesus' effort. Romans 3, 20 says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. 
the result is that the whole striving and scale stuff is is a waste of time. It gets us nowhere. And in fact, the idea of there being, you know, good and bad and are you doing good or not? And, you know, the scripture and the, the law and stuff like that that points out the things that we don't do right is just to make us realize that we're all messed up. We all are lost if we don't have a savior. But Paul goes on in the next verse. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who we are, no matter what you what number you are on that scale, you are made right through faith in Jesus by coming to Jesus and saying, "I need help. I messed up. I admit my wrong, and I'm asking for your help and forgiveness to save me." Um Faith, not our effort, is what it is. The forgiven criminal couldn't turn over a new leaf. He's hanging there, dying on a cross, being crucified. He had no opportunity to start helping the poor. He had no chance to put money in the offering to do stuff for a good cause. He, he had no opportunity to start reading the Bible and praying and fasting and doing other kind of Christian activities. He couldn't even get baptized. He's nailed to a cross dying. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people. This guy had no chance to do the good things that we think about make you in the right standing with God because it's not the good things we do that give us a right standing with God. It's our coming to Christ and receiving a Savior, the one who makes it up for us. Jesus made a way for this guy. He couldn't do it himself. Jesus makes a way for you and me. We can't do it ourselves. Jesus paid the price so that we could be forgiven. We couldn't do it ourselves. Jesus rose from the dead, bringing new life that was a transforming life, giving us a brand new start. We can't do that ourselves. We can only receive the gift, the free gift that is offered to us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again, because God raised Jesus from the dead. Just like that criminal, you can be forgiven. You can have a transformed life. But better than him, yes, he couldn't do anything to fix his life. He could only call out for help. And it was at the last moments of his life that he experienced this. But you know what? Jesus came to give us an abundant life. Not a deathbed conversion so that we just at the last second, get into heaven and just experience salvation at the very end and, and miss out on a whole lifetime. No, Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And that starts when we give our life to him and experience this new transformed life. When we are forgiven and we become a new person, and then we can start to live life as Jesus intended for us. Do not play games and say, I'll wait until the very end of the last second, and then I'll just slip in at the last second into God's favor. Experience the new life, the new beginning, the hope, the purpose, all that God has for you, this abundant life. Start it now. Don't wait. You're just denying yourself what God has planned for you. It's so much better than punching your ticket for a last second entry into heaven. This hope and purpose and deep satisfaction and joy that Jesus brings us can happen starting right now. Think about the joy of being able to have whatever time, whatever many years you have left on this life, living it in the joy and the power and the purpose and the presence of Jesus with you.
That's what God wants for you. It's good news because it's meant to give you a full life. It's not what you do that can make a difference. It's what Jesus can do for us and what Jesus, in fact, has already done. He's provided the way for us to be forgiven and to be with him in paradise. But a paradise that begins now as we experience this new life in him and his purpose and his presence with us. Admit your need. Turn to Jesus and believe and then choose to make him your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this good news. The good news is pointed out through this story that recorded your time dying on the cross. Even in your death, you were able to teach. You were able to provide salvation for this man who was dying for what he deserved. And yet, admitting his need and turning to you for hope and asking and experiencing forgiveness, believing that it's possible to experience new life and and hope and forgiveness through you, and then choosing to put his life in your hands. That's what we're called to do too. Lord, thank you that we are not in that situation where we are being killed and in that process just desperately at the last second turning to you. No, we can do that right now. God, as we admit our need, admit that we are not perfect, and there's no way we're ever going to be perfect, and your scale requires perfection. We admit our need, and then we believe that what you've done makes forgiveness possible and a new beginning possible, and then choosing to receive that good news and follow you, give our life into your hands so that you could remake it a new birth, a new beginning, and a life filled with your presence and following you and experiencing the abundant, wonderful life that you promised to give us, life to the full, when we are made new in you. Lord, thank you for that good news. And I pray for anybody who is hearing me and thinking about this and has not made that decision, that they would simply do the same thing that that thief did coming to you and receiving new life and forgiveness and the promise of always being with you throughout this life and into eternity. Thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know where you are. I don't know if you made a decision just now, if you made certain that you were in a right standing with God. I hope you did, if you haven't already. And uh, I'd love to hear Um, that you did and be able to encourage you and uh, perhaps uh, come alongside you as you begin this new relationship with Jesus. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye.